Welcome to today's video. My name is Madelon Vos and this is Madelon Talks. Today we'll discuss the most important macroeconomic and crypto related news of the week. And in this week's video, we're going to take a look in the near future because there is so much more to come. We're just at the beginning and this not only in terms of price, but also in terms of innovation. And today we're going to take a look at what the innovation might be and what the future might look like also in macroeconomic terms. So not only when it comes to crypto, but also when it comes to our economy, because there are some new things evolving and there are some things that we need to discuss when it comes to the future of commodities and the S&P 500 because we see some strange comparisons. So we will discuss that. But first, I'm going to put myself in the right corner of this video. And I want to make sure that you are subscribed to this channel and also make sure that you press the blue thumb in order to rank these videos more or higher in YouTube to make sure that everyone who is interested in macroeconomics and in cryptocurrencies find these videos because they are really important when it comes to getting more knowledge around these subjects. So we're going to start with our good friend Holger from Germany. And he tweeted, as long as the music is playing, you've got to get up and dance. And this is a great quote. And it was quoted as well in the movie, The Big Short. But actually, it's from someone who worked uh, at Citibank. At the time, the great financial uh, crisis started, the GFC. And this was a time in which or at least right before this time started in 2007, this was the time that everyone knew that something wasn't going great and it had to do with the subprime mortgages and the collapse of the whole credit system in 2008. But they felt that there was something going on already. But he said, as long as the music is playing, you get to get up and dance. So make sure that you follow this trend in order to uh, be at this party so that's what he said and um, it's a very important one and plan B retweeted this one as well and Holger is actually mentioning the balance sheet right now of the G3 and these are the central banks the biggest central banks um, this is the Bank of Japan the Bank of uh, uh, Europe and the Federal Reserve so the central banks and um, as you can see, here we have the phase in 2007 and 2008. And you can see how the expansion of the balance sheet was at that time. And after the, the, the great financial uh, crisis happened, this kept rising and rising and rising. And here we are at the new crisis which evolved in 2020 of course in march 2020 and then the balance sheet expanded even more and we're now sitting at 24.3 trillion which is a lot and holger is actually saying we know that something is not going well but we have to get up and continue what we are doing right now but we of course know that something is going on and not only we know that something is going on, but also the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, knows that something is going on. And take a look at what he's, not what he's saying, but what he's doing. Take a look at his eyes, for example. how much he is blinking during his speech. And usually when someone is blinking during, um, <laughs> during their uh, talk, this means that they're actually hiding something or maybe even lying. So his body language isn't suggesting that he really thinks that inflation is transitory or that he really thinks that we're actually moving the right way. So we know that he has to choose between two options. And on the other hand, on the one hand, we have this, the expansion of the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve and together with low interest rates, which is actually a strategy you would use when you have a deep, deep, deep crisis. And 
right now we can't do anything if a crisis evolves. And on the other hand, he has to choose between raising the interest rates and tightening policy, but with the side note that this whole system, as Holger spoke about, the dancing, the whole dance is going to stop. The music is going to stop playing. And if he chooses for expanding the balance sheet and for uh, continuing what he's doing right now, what they're doing right now, then we're going to see higher and higher inflation. And this is actually not what we want to see. But we saw Lynn Alden tweeted, tweeting about the dollar system. And this is actually the system what it's all about. And um, I just want you to take a good look at what's actually happening right here with the Federal Reserve, the balance sheet. Then we have the onshore entities, for example, the banks. We have the offshore entities, uh, for example, the money markets. And if you take a look at this, if you get what, what, what is actually happening right here, then you probably know that this is not the way it should go. And you probably know the quote from Henry Ford, if the world would now know how money works, then we would probably get a revolution. And this is actually what is happening right now. A lot of people are kind of feeling that this system is coming to an end. And not only we as crypto Twitter, but also, the regular guy in the street is seeing that his purchasing power is decreasing and is seeing that someone sitting at a central bank doesn't really know what to do. And this is where everything comes together. And I think that economists are arguing too much about what should happen. Over the last couple of 10, 20, 30 years, we have economists reading books about the Keynesian school of economics. The Keynesian school of economics is all about inflation is good, deflation is bad, and the fact that a central bank needs to step in. And that's what central banks did. And a lot of, or at least not a lot of econ economists, but some economics, there was a small group of economics, uh, for example, uh, through the Meister, and they were a fan of the Austrian school of economics in which you have a more libertarian vision on um, money and money and the state should be separated and the central bank should not step in. Um, the market has to decide on its own. And right now we see that from 1971 in which the decision was made to separate the dollar from the backing of gold, um, this whole bubble started and at that time it was the only option to do but right now when looking back it wasn't a good decision so we are actually struggling right now and um, this is a lecture Drew the Meister tweeted about and um, this is the, uh, the name I will put it down in the link below as well and um, it's about the Austrian method that's used in Austrian economics. And to actually watch this multiple times or listen to this, it's it, you can only listen to it, there's nothing to see, but it's really important to understand how economists think when it comes to the Aust Austrian School of Economics. And this is where my whole story started. I started with reading about Bitcoin and um, then I found out that our money is broken, that a complete system is broken and that the Austrian School of Economics is a way in which I would, um, I think that money is way better when it's not in the hands of governments or central banks or whatever. And that's what I like about Bitcoin. And you should definitely listen to this one if you're interested in macroeconomics. I will put a link down below. And what I wanted to discuss is a new tweet or I think it's actually an old tweet, but it's a really important one because I'm going to connect it with a new tweet from Kevin. But this is Tavi Costa. And Tavi Costa is uh, showing us the Bloomberg Precious Metal Sub Index divided by the S&P equal weighted commodity sector. So here 
is the index figure that we are seeing on this chart from the precious metal divided by the S&P 500. Let's, let's name it like this. And um, as you can see, we are at a low, the thirdest lowest level since, um, let's say the 2000 or so. Um, we're actually hitting 1.34 right now. And this is a really important one because precious metals are now at their cheapest levels re re relative to uh, commodities since 2009. So as you can see, what happened after this indicator gave a sign in 2008, the price of gold went upward. You can see in 2018, we found out that this was at a new low and then the price of gold went upward. Right now we're seeing this low again. So this might be a signal that the price will go upward again. So it's an important one. Uh, the other two times the ratio reached such a depressed level also marked incredible buying opportunities. So this might be a buying opportunity for gold. And this is actually a tweet from, I think it was the beginning of August. And I want to show you this as well from Kevin C. Smith. And Kevin is speaking about the CPI. With CPI um, understated and rising inflation unlikely to be transitory, what we've discussed over the last couple of months, I think it is six months or so, the timing to buy undervalued small cap precious metals miners and sell large cap growth stocks is probably as good as it gets. So as you can see in this chart, we are having the uh, gold to S&P ratio on the left uh, side of this chart. And this is the ratio of gold to the S&P 500. So it's a bit different from the precious metal sub index to the S&P equal weighted commodity sector. But right now, here we have the S&P uh, against gold, gold to S&P ratio. And what we are actually seeing right now is that this is at a low of around, let's say, 0 0.8, I think it's 0 point, no, 0 0.5. Let's say it's 0 0.5. And this follows the trend of inflation really well. The vertical rise of CPI looks like 1973. And this is what we've discussed in 1973. We had a period of stagflation in which the economic growth um, slowed down. The unemployment was quite high and the interest rates were quite low as well. But we had high inflation and there was nothing that they could do besides the fact that they could raise interest rates until highs around 15%. You're hearing these good, 15%. And the question right now is what is the central bank going to do when inflation is rising? But also what are we going to do with our money? How are we going to protect it against losing our purchasing power when we put money in a bank, when we are giving a loan to the bank and getting negative interest rates. So taking a look at this consumer price index year on year on um, the uh, end of July hit 5.4%. And now the big question is what's going to happen with the gold to the S&P 500 ratio? So the real question is what's going to happen? Is the price of gold going to rise or is the S&P 500 going to decrease or maybe even going to collapse or are we going to see both at the same time are we going to see that the price of gold is rising um, and at the same time the s p 500 is decreasing in value he is actually saying the timing to buy undervalued small cap precious metal miners and sell over lar overvalued large cap growth stocks is probably as good as it gets so he's actually saying you have to do the both you have to sell the large cap growth stocks and have to buy and this this is quite heavy have to buy small cap precious metal miners because when the price of gold and silver as well are rising when these prices are rising the companies who mine the gold and the silver are doing way better than the price of gold and silver is actually doing but if you want to remain your purchasing power then i would suggest 
to, or at least in my own portfolio, I would suggest from for my own uh, sake to just um, put my money from the bank to gold instead of making this switch because this is a heavy one. Uh, but you can always, or at least I can always down leverage uh, on the fact that I have some, let's say I have some overvalued large cap pro stocks, I can switch them to precious metal miners, but you have to make sure that these are um, very carefully selected and that you select the, the good ones. Um, but this is a buying opportunity again for gold, same as Tavi Akta saw three weeks ago. And then we have Holger again. Uh, we started with a tweet from Holger and now he's back Deloitte with a Deloitte blockchain survey. And this survey highlights that crypto and other assets will replace fiat within 10 years. And 81% of the respondents agreed that technology is broadly scalable and has high achieved mainstream adoption. So we are actually at the beginning of something that's so big we can't even imagine. This is gonna be way better and way more and way faster than we've actually seen right now. And there has been so much going on over the last couple of months over the last couple of years and this is something that we could never expect happening governments making their own digital assets facebook creating an own cryptocurrency um, bitcoin doing this great in terms of market cap all the other DeFi um, concepts that are actually uh, evolving right now peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending there's so much going on in the world it's like the internet just started, it's just the beginning and there's so much great that's coming. And I'm super excited about this because we can, um, we're at the first row watching what's going to happen and this might change the world and it's it's just so cool. Um, there's something else that's so cool but not so cool at the same time. And when we are talking about all of these innovations over the last couple of years and in the future, of course, we have to take a look at what happened in El Salvador. In June, they declared Bitcoin as a legal tender. And this law comes into effect at the, I think it was the first week of September. So the 7th or the 6th or so. And this is where it becomes really interesting. Um, when looking at the United States, they are really nervous about what's going on. And the state of America even sanctioned 14 El Salvadorian government officials. The World Bank and the IMF issued warnings and the ELSL bonds tanked. But President Najib Bukele ignored all of these red, red flags and he just dived in. He wants to make Bitcoin a legal tender in the first week of September in his country, the first country in the world. But there is something underneath this and that's what needs to be discussed. And I think this is where it becomes really interesting and really exciting as well. So the IMF gave a loan to El Salvador and I think it was around one billion. And when it comes to the risks that El Salvador is taking uh, in terms of making Bitcoin a legal tender, there are some people that are actually saying that the IMF might want to have their money back because they're now at a higher risk than they were before in terms of paying the debts off, paying the money back to the IMF where the loan came from. So there might be a situation in which El Salvador needs to have 1 billion USD in order to pay back the IMF. And I think that there is a good chance that the Bitcoin com community will manage this. And this is where it becomes really, really interesting because that's where we as a community are stronger than the government. So actually, I would love to see that America says we want to have or that the central bank says we want to have our money back because then 
the community needs to step in. And we've heard Bukele talking about the fact that they have a volcano and that they're going to do some mining. So what they're going to, what they can do in order to get one billion, they can uh, create, for example, a bond, a bond that um, has an interest rate of, let's say, 3%, 4% of five years or so. And this bond comes together with the crypto mine or is issued um, on top of the crypto mine. And the community, the Bitcoin community can buy these bonds. Then they can figure out how they can find the 1 billion and pay back the IMF. And the Bitcoin community can manage this completely. So the next two weeks are very important in order to see if they're going to step in. So this is not the end of uh, Bitcoin for El Salvador. Of course it's not, but this is just going to be really interesting and we're gonna, gonna follow what's going to happen next. Um, I found this tweet from Pump as well. Pseudonymity is going to be so valuable in the future. And this is an, um, a tweet he usually tweets uh, these nice quotes and uh, I love these nice quotes but pseudonymity is really important because I was in Belgium last weekend and we discussed the fact that KYC um, Heidi uh, the blockchain chick tweeted that KYC is a scam and we just discussed the fact if KYC really is a scam because the um, thing is that the financial regulators are trying to fit crypto in the design boxes that are already there. So we need to do KYC because that's how we always did it. We want to know our customer, but that's not what crypto is all about. Crypto is about pseudonymity and not about anonymity, but it's also not about giving your complete identity away to a third party. Um, so what you actually wanted to have is your own wallet, your own identity, and you can just give a sign, um, yes, I'm 18, or yes, I'm um, wealthy enough to get a loan or something like that. And you don't need to declare everything to a third party. So pseudonymity is going to be so valuable in the future. And also when it comes to regulating these kinds of things, and when they are trying to get terrorists away, when they're trying to get money launderers away. And this is where pseudonymity can do lots of things when you can still own your own, your own identity. And that's the only thing that we have online that we need to protect really well. So this is actually going to be really valuable in the future. And then we have this. This is the 87th Ether rock that has been purchased for 187 ETH. And that's now a price of 611,000 US dollars. And this is actually insane. There are three groups of people that are now watching this. Uh, price movement of these ether rocks and the first group of people is actually saying there are only 100 rocks available and there are only 1000 uh, guys with a cap available and only 10,000 giraffes available and um, this is what scarcity is about this is what art is about and when it comes to art versus digital arts it's actually um, the bigger fool that's buying this um, so it's the value that you are giving to something that is a piece of art. And they're like, this is vintage when it comes to the NFTs. And I actually completely agree with the fact that NFTs is a completely new world and that, are, that there are some things that might be interesting in the future but this to me this is just insane there there's another group of people that is saying this is more for criminals using this to get money around um other people are saying this is actually uh, not i don't know what this is all about but in my honest opinion i feel that nfts is such a big world and it's gonna be or might be so important in the future uh, we can think about what's going to happen in a digital world. And this is just the beginning of the internet. What we've just 
just discussed, there's so much going around, around in the crypto world, in the DeFi space, in the NFT world. But we've also seen that there are uh, things that are not making it. For example, the ICOs or the IEOs or um, there are so many things in this world that come and go. But when it comes to these NFTs, it's going to be really interesting. But this, I would never buy an Ether rock for 611,000 USD. Um, so just to let you know uh, that this is going on as well. And if you're interested in NFTs, just take a look at it because it's mind blowing. Then we have PayPal bringing crypto services to the UK customers. You might know that PayPal already is offering crypto services to the uh, US um, customers. So in the US, you can transact Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin and Bitcoin Cash. And right now, they're also going to offer it to UK customers starting uh, the beginning of this week. And we're going to see what this is going to do with the price of Bitcoin for UK citizens. It's harder to uh, use crypto exchanges because of the laws and regulations. Um, and uh, yeah, we might see if they want to use PayPal in order to uh, have or own Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. The only thing is that customers must have a verified identity in order to uh, buy uh, cryptos. And it's not supported for uh, businesses. So that's important to know. But uh, here we have the identity aspect again. Uh, we probably have the KYC um, uh, rules. And um, yeah, this is where digital identity becomes really interesting again. But we're just in this... Um, framework of regulations and different boxes that these products need to fit in. So these rules and regulations will be different in the next couple of five or maybe even 10 years. Uh, for example, when the car was released for the first time, there was no infrastructure at all. So people had a car, but they couldn't drive. And it was all road, um, like gravel or, or stones and they just needed to design the frame, uh, the framework and they needed to design the infrastructure. And that's what we're needing to design again with this, when it comes to this technology. Um, so this is really important and we're going to take a look at what's going to happen next. Um, as you can see, the Bitcoin stock to flow model life chart is now actually looking good again. Um, this is the stock to flow. Here we have the price of Bitcoin. This is uh, the, the, the years that uh, Bitcoin exists. And this is the stock to flow 360, 463 days. Um, and we're actually doing the same thing as we did in 2013. And uh, in my honest opinion, this is looking good there are a lot of people that are saying no we're gonna just double top or we're going down from this point again but i don't see it going down and when looking at this chart here you can see the cycle low multiple and this is the multiple current price uh, divided by the cycle low price and here we actually seeing that this is from the halving, it's almost looking like the same thing as we saw in 2013. But then we are going a bit lower in terms of uh, current price versus cycle low price. So we might go a bit lower than we've seen in um, 2013. So maybe we're going to go as low as, let's say, this point. And we're going to hit the all-time high around this point. Then we are like... Um, we're now 300, 400, 500 days away. Then we're probably around 600. So we're 120 days. So this might be the end of this year that we're going to see a high, which could be as high as this. And then we're gonna sit around 50 times, uh, multiple of 50. And so we can actually calculate what the price around that time will be. Um, 50 times the low. I'm not sure what the low was around the halving, but let's say that we're going to be around 100,000 
that will be great actually also in terms of the stock to flow model and um, we're actually sitting right here right now so this is this is still looking good also when looking at the tweets from plan b he's still very um enthusiastic about the fact that we're doing like clockwork as he says but there's one thing and that's about the month august he said that we might see a lower low than we've had in july so keep that in mind we might see a retrace again but for now it's actually doing great and then i want to uh show you this one nobody is more fun on the internet than the bitcoiners of course the price of bitcoin hit 50k this week again for the first time in three months and we're going to take a look at the price of bitcoin but of course we as bitcoiners like to um celebrate everything that's happening in this market and we are just really enthusiastic about the fact that this is actually happening and that we're front row seated um in this uh big movement i just wanted to tell you by the way that i'm on twitter as well um with the handle madlon vos m-a-d-l and v-o-s and two double low dashes and um just make sure to follow me on uh, twitter as well so you will get notified when there's news online also make sure to like these videos, press on the blue button if you like this video so it will be recommended for more people to watch. I think it's really important for them to understand what's actually going on right now. Um, we're going to take a look at the chart and this is one of my favorite things from doing this video. I love technical analysis. And as you can see, we're now in this head and shoulders pattern and this is actually now evolving. And we had a target point of around 52 Okay, and we've discussed this um, when we're still sitting around this area, I think. And we can calculate the target price. We did calculate the target price from this point to the head. I think we should do that again. So, and then we can just calculate what the target price would be. The target price would sit around 52, between 52 and 53. Okay, so we're still following this trend. We're actually almost there. And we're now in this uptrend. And we just hit the uptrend several times. Then we fell back into this uptrend. Now we're again going towards this, this point. Um, we could hit this upward uh, trend again, but then we probably fall back. Uh, for now, we have resistance around this area. This is uh, 48.9. Let's say it's uh, 49. And of course, 50 is a really important um, level when it comes to it's 50K. Same as 30, as 40, as 20. And um, this is more like a psychological level. If from a technical perspective, it's not really an important one. Yeah, you can say it's an important one, but um, we just want to hold 50K. But if we go down, this is the strongest support at 40. Uh, uh, 84.9 uh, and um, right now it's actually looking good we have had some bearish divergence but still meh, nothing to worry about and when taking a look at this we kind of see that we're high on our side so we could see a, a, a move back and it can be a not a tough one it can be a, s a super slowly one um, as you can see on this, I'm going to take a look at what we can draw over here. So we might see a move downward again, but it's not go going to be a big one. I don't expect the market to go down again. No, this is a really important uh, support level. If we go down, then then this will be the strongest support line on like 44 or so. So nothing to worry about right now. We're just hitting. Uh, this area and this is an important area because we've had this as an as a um, support line around this level then we have this level again uh, it's at the same at the same I think yeah it's around uh, 50 or so and if we go higher than this area then we the only strong resistance that we have is around 60k um so for now it's actually looking good it will be healthy if the market goes down quite a bit this is a support line over here but if we go down to 
43 or so as plan B predicted for August it's also completely fine but first I'm going to expect that we're going to hit the target point of 51 52 or so or near the target point with the wake of the candle at least so actually we're quite uh, good right now I'm still very bullish even though for the medium short term we're going to see uh, a low a lower close than we've had over the last month uh, in July but we're still really bullish and it doesn't look like a bear market or anything soon or fast or whatever the outs are also going uh, doing great so for now I would like to thank you for watching this video I hope you've enjoyed this video I did also make sure to press the blue thumb if you like this video in order to uh, make sure that more people can find these videos because it's really important that we spread the knowledge about these subjects. I hope to see you soon next week at the new Model and Toast. For now, I wish you a great week. Thanks for watching. Bye!